Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Duncan Brown and I'm a trustee with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I hope this webinar finds all of those tuned in safe and well. Before I introduce Dr. Tara O'Toole from InQtel, a few quick announcements. Our next webinar, we are taking the month of August off, will be on September 24th when Dean Cheng from the Heritage Foundation will be with us to discuss China. Specifically, he will discuss Chinese history, including their past greatness, their century of humiliation, and their current rise to power. He will also discuss China's relations with its neighbors. He will discuss the U.S.-China relationship and possibilities for where it might be headed. He will discuss options with pros and cons for the U.S. and our allies moving forward in dealing with China. And finally, he will discuss his thoughts on how the U.S. should deal with China and why. And now for tonight's webinar. In terms of logistics, we are using the Zoom webinar platform tonight, so everyone is automatically muted and will stay muted throughout the presentation. Addition, the only persons you will see on your screen will be either myself or Dr. Tara O'Toole. For questions tonight, we will handle that through the Q&A button. The Q&A button should be located on the bottom of your screen. Just click on the button, type in your question, and hit submit. At the end of Dr. O'Toole's prepared remarks, I will consolidate questions and relay them to her. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs website in about two weeks. Dr. O'Toole will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, at which point we will conduct the Q&A. And now to tonight's speaker. Dr. Tara O'Toole is a Senior Fellow and Executive Vice President at InQtel a private nonprofit strategic investment firm that links the United States in intelligence community and venture-backed startup firms on the leading edge of technological innovation. Dr. O'Toole is leading a strategic InQtel initiative to explore the opportunities and risks that likely to arise as a result of advances in the biological sciences and biotechnologies with a particular focus on detection of and defense against biological attacks. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. O'Toole served as the Undersecretary of Science and Technology at the Department of Homeland Security. She was the principal advisor to the Secretary on matters related to science and technology. In the decade before becoming Undersecretary, Dr. Undersecretary, Dr. O'Toole founded and directed two university-based think tanks devoted to civilian biodefense. Specifically, she was a professor of public health and the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Civilian Biodefense Studies at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In 2003, the center and its staff became affiliated with the University of Pittsburgh. From 1994 to 1998, Dr. O'Toole served in the Clinton administration as Assistant Secretary for Environmental Safety and Health in the Department of Energy. Finally, Dr. O'Toole is also a past chair of the board of the Federation of American Scientists, and she is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Tara O'Toole. Thank you, Duncan. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with you today and talk about biology and national security risks and opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, we are at an inflection point in the history of technology and science, and I'm going to try and make um, five main points. First of all, our advancing knowledge of the life sciences of how organisms operate, reproduce, and react to the environment is converging with digital technologies to create a bio-revolution that is going to be hugely impactful on society. <clears throat> Secondly, biotechnologies of many kinds, including synthetic biology, uh, will be foundational to the 21st century economy, and they're going to be a critical area uh, for global and geopolitical competition. China, in particular, is implementing an aggressive strategy to become the world's leader in biotech uh, and the top competitor in the bioeconomy. Now, the United States is the innovation engine of this biorevolution as a consequence of our long investment in the National Institutes of Health and University Research, but our translational capacity is weak and puts us at a disadvantage. 
And finally, I'm going to make a few comments on how synthetic biology and various other biotechnologies are critical to the COVID response, but so far have been underutilized. Next slide, please. So what's happening is that our understanding of how living organisms grow, reproduce, repair, and react to the environment has been growing uh, exponentially. Um, and this growth and understanding has in part been made possible by uh, the increasing computational power and uh, digital capacities that uh, we have accrued over the last 50 years. Among other things, these capacities have given us <clears throat> the instrumentation needed to actually quantitatively measure and observe biomolecules at the nanometer level, uh, which has contributed mightily not only to our understanding, but our capacity to manipulate biological organisms and their parts and pieces. The biorevolution, which includes but is not limited to synthetic biology, is going to have huge consequences across a wide range of industries. This is not just about biomedicine. It is also going to, and already is, impacting agriculture, energy, material science, and it's going to become a fundamental manufacturing platform in the next 10 or 20 years, as I will explain. It's hard to identify a major social problem that is not going to have biology and biotech as at least part of its solution, uh, which is one of the reasons that so many countries are interested in developing a bioeconomy. Uh, there are very low barriers to um, entry in biotech. Um, you don't need to be build a um, and a uranium enrichment plant in order to get into the industry. Um, and developing nations as well as highly developed nations are definitely uh, pursuing biotechnology as part of their economic plan. The markets are global, highly capitalized because these products are avidly desired along, around the world. And as I'll explain, the economic and national security implications are very significant. On the other hand, um, powerful biotechnology, like all powerful, bio, all powerful technologies, comes with uh, a downside. Almost everything um, in biotech is dual use. That is, the core technologies that you need to build vaccines are essentially the core technologies needed to build bioweapons and uh, that are resistant to vaccines. And all of these technologies <clears throat> uh, are increasingly accessible to a larger and larger population as the industry builds out. They're increasingly automated, um, meaning many people are, are going to have access to these technologies. And as we begin to think about or actually manipulate the living world, uh, ethical concerns are going to raise their head uh, and be uh, very complicated and will undoubtedly differ from country to country. Next slide, please. Most of the core technologies that are fueling the biorevolution have been around for a while. Um, and they amount to um, the capacity to read, write, and edit the code of life. Um, one of the great insights of the past 20 years in science is the recognition that life is written in code and that biology is essentially programmable. Instead of using ones and zeros to program life, we use the four nucleotides of DNA. Um, and we, are, we have been sequencing DNA that is reading the genetic code since the 1970s, getting faster, more accurate at it, doing it much more cheaply and efficiently. And in fact, the capacity to read DNA is improving much faster than Moore's law. Writing DNA, that is DNA synthesis, is still a slower operation. It's more expensive, but it too is improving fast. In addition, <clears throat> in the last 10 years, we have been um, 
using CRISPR, which is an old uh, immune mechanism in bacteria that was discovered to essentially be the Swiss army knife of gene editing. CRISPR is um, very cheap, fast to use. You can learn how to do it uh, in, if you're a laboratory technician in about an hour and a half. And it allows one to um, alter specific DNA sequences um, and modify gene function uh, very easily relative to the old methods, which we have been using since the 1970s. Back in 1978, we first used recombinant DNA to make synthetic insulin for the first time out of E. coli, a bacteria. And we've been doing a lot of gene editing since. But CRISPR has um, changed the game because of its ease of use and its speed and its uh, low cost. If you put all of this together, um, you, um, you have uh, the enterprise of synthetic biology, which is also called engineered biology. Um, and I will explain that more in a minute, but as I said, and we'll repeat, Synthetic biology is likely to become the most important, if not one of the most important manufacturing uh, platform in the next decades. Added to all of this <clears throat> are artificial intelligence methods, um, which allow these fundamental foundational technologies, DNA synthesis, sequencing, and um, editing uh, to essentially be turbocharged and become increasingly accurate and specific. Artificial intelligence is already being applied to a wide um, swath of biology uh, and is having um, real impacts, not only in synthetic biology, but also in drug discovery, diagnostic imaging, and personalized medicine. Um, next slide, please. What is synthetic biology? <clears throat> Um, it's basically using living organisms as factories to make stuff you want. Um, we are trying to engineer biology in a way that allows us to um, direct organisms, usually yeast or bacteria, um, to make stuff we want in a reliable, repeatable way. And there's many projects within the overall enterprise of synthetic biology, including the creation of catalogs of standardized parts. So that, for example, once you figure out exactly what this sequence of nucleotides this gene does, you can use it again and again in different contexts for different purposes. Um, it's come a long way in the past 10 years or so, and uh, it is already part of your world. This is not a futuristic vision of what biology can do. This is what's happening now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and synthetic biology is, just, is not just a technique um, to improve biomed, though it is certainly uh, very important in the creation of new therapeutics and vaccines, as I will explain, but it's already responsible uh, for uh, the production of about 20% of all the industrial chemicals used in the world. Um, food has been a big target of synthetic biology. If you've had an impossible burger, which is a plant-based burger that tastes like real meat, at least according uh, to published literature, it tastes like meat because it contains heme, a protein found in meat, found in blood actually, that uh, the company um, cultured out of yeast and can put together in large quantities in their impossible burgers. There's also lots of materials with new and desirable properties being made with SynBio. Um, for example, um, having figured out the gene sequences um, inherent in spider silk, uh, we're using those genes and asking organisms to make fibers that are then woven into fabrics that have been used in uh, very high-tech, um, extreme sport-type gear, uh, sneakers, jackets, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, the energy business will definitely be affected by synthetic biology. Um, the markets um, are discouraging right now, but uh, the low pollution level of um, many um, SynBio experiments will become increasingly attractive. Um, human engineering is already uh, ongoing. There are clinical trials in progress now with real humans trying to delete or add genes that are the uh, cause of severe genetically inherited diseases. At least one seems to be working. Uh, they are also, SynBio is also um, key to a lot of the advances being made in cancer uh, therapy, transplant organs. Um, we are trying to figure out how to synthesize whole organs that can take the place um, of failed uh, human organs. Um, so that, for example, an artificial pancreas uh, could be used instead of insulin to eliminate type 2 diabetes. Uh, one of the most um, intense areas of uh, application of SynBio is in agriculture. If you can switch out the genes in a plant to make it more pest resistant or hardier under adverse environmental conditions like drought or flood, um, you um, don't have to wait for the plant to grow up and test it under those conditions. Uh, China is working very hard in bio, uh, in uh, synthetic biology and agriculture, not only um, in the application um, of plants, but they are also growing animals, food animals such as pigs, uh, that are much more muscly uh, than your normal pig. There was a report out in June um, by the McKinsey um, Global Studies Group um, that affer asserted that 60% of the physical inputs to the global economy could be produced biologically. Uh, and only one third of those inputs are actual biological materials and only half um, of what they are contemplating as economic inputs are related to health. Um, whether that happens in 10 years or 20 years is difficult to speculate about, um, but the McKinsey, McKinsey report opines that this uh, new capacity to manufacture stuff could be worth two to four trillion dollars annually in the global economy, depending upon uh, how rapidly it is taken up and um, uh, incorporated. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to talk about national security applications in synthetic biology, and these are all examples of um, what could be done today. Again, this is not very futuristic. These are um, current capabilities. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to bang on this point. We need to be... Um, extremely competitive in synthetic biology in order to maintain economic competitiveness globally uh, because uh, synth synthetic bio is going to be so important to the economy. We could definitely use synthetic biology to improve the resilience of our supply chain. So for example, almost all the latex in the world comes from Malaysia. So when we needed um, magnitudes of order more uh, personal protective gear uh, than we normally had for COVID response. There was no way to um, uh, efficiently uh, increase the supply of latex out of Malaysia to the extent that it was needed. Had we been better prepared, we could have made latex and many other materials uh, using synthetic biology. Um, I'll come back to synthetic biology's role in epidemic detection, management, and uh, response. We've been thinking about this uh, for quite some time at NQTEL. Um, but there are also a lot of direct military applications. Uh, you can use synthetic biology to develop materials with unique performance properties, as I mentioned, uh, with spider silk. Um, you can also um, 
uh, use it um, in uh, places where you do not have a whole factory. You can use it at various scales and you do not need um, a lot of expensive or complex equipment necessarily um, so that you could deploy this on, on ships in the field and so forth and perhaps as we have been testing in space. Um, it is the key to rapid design and protection of medical countermeasures in the event of either a deliberate bioattack or um, an emergent infectious disease. Um, and we are absolutely, definitely moving towards human augmentation. We already have prosthetic limbs that can be operated uh, by the person thinking that they want to raise their hand. Uh, technology brain interfaces are under intense study um, and are already being used, for example, to treat some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and other maladies. And as we apply artificial intelligence methods to understanding and deeply reading the human genome, we will be able to manipulate complex human traits, that is, human traits like intelligence that are not simply inherited, but are the, react, the result of uh, complicated interactions between genes, between other genes that promote or suppress different uh, genetic um, manifestations and so forth. Um, so it is not out of the question and it is not uh, at all beyond um, uh, reach in the next 50 years that we will actually be genetically manipulating intelligence, for example, or one's capacity uh, for strength, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Now, um, back to the biorevolution more broadly. Um, when you ask people uh, what the, actually, let's go to the next slide. Um, we'll skip this one. When you ask people what the national security implications of biology are, they usually um, go blank. Um, but if they thought about it at all, the first thing they mention is bioweapons. And there is no question that uh, the biorevolution has made it much easier to build a biological weapon. Um, and you don't need any fancy gene engineering. In the 1960s, the US built biological weapons that were as um, lethal and covered as large an area as nuclear weapons. And they were explicitly designed as basically alternative to nukes. And they were tested in virtually every forum short of actual war. And again, this was using 1960s technology. We can now engineer biological weapons. We can make organisms that are resistant to vaccines, that are resistant to antibiotics. We can combine different diseases and peculiar ways that would make them very difficult to diagnose or treat. And we are not limited to infectious diseases. We are, as I said, learning to manipulate um, how the brain functions um, and a weapon that would make everybody go to sleep or feel extremely anxious uh, is not out of the question. It's also important to realize that agriculture, which is a trillion dollar industry in the US, could also be targeted. Bioweapons are very difficult to collect intelligence against um, because virtually everything uh, that you need, as well as all of the operations, are dual use. They look like legitimate biology. They have a very small footprint and they're hard to track. Um, and as I said earlier, the, um, the science, the know-how, and the equipment um, are all easily and increasingly accessible and increasingly automated. So that's the first um, bio, uh, national security uh, threat that we have to worry about in the bio realm. The second, as we are living through, are epidemics of naturally occurring infectious diseases. We are in an age of epidemics, and we have been for the past 20 years or so. The, the frequency and the impact of infectious disease outbreaks has been increasing. That's very well documented. And about 70% of these outbreaks are coming from animal diseases that spill over into human populations. Um, West Nile virus appeared in 1999 for the first time in North America. 
We then had SARS, MERS, not to mention HIV, which came out of monkeys in Africa, we belatedly realized, et cetera, et cetera. Almost all of this increase in uh, human epidemics is a consequence of uh, our trade and travel patterns. We go everywhere all the time, very fast, or we did until March. And also we are increasingly, because of population pressures and commercial intent, intruding into once remote ecosystems where we're coming in contact with the new bucks that have lived in animals. Um, I used to have a hard time uh, convincing um, national security people that epidemics could be disruptive, costly, and even destabilizing. Um, I think that point has been made by now. And we could do better. We need to develop a much more strategic approach to epidemic management, and we can. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, the third bio threat that um, threatens uh, national security is, I would argue, uh, potentially the most important in the long term. And that is uh, the threat of becoming non-competitive in the global bioeconomy. Um, this is particularly um, painful because the U.S. is the innovation engine of the bio revolution. Um, since the 50s, we spent about a trillion dollars on NIH, and it is the basic science coming out of NIH, uh, other government, um, CDC, and universities uh, that is really behind uh, the current capabilities. Uh, we have the largest biotech economy right now, which um, Bob Carlson has estimated is about 3% of our GDP, though it's very poorly measured and tracked. And uh, the biotech sector is growing by about 10% a year and has done so over the past decade. Um, but as I say, it's not well tracked. Um, in 2019, for example, um, US biotech uh, companies raised about $22 billion in VC funds uh, over uh, about 1,500 deals, and they're going to break that record this year uh, for sure. Um, we hold the most uh, patents and publications, uh, but China is uh, not only close behind, but overtaking us. They're spending a lot more on R&D than we are. Um, the NIH, uh, which is getting a budget raise this year, I heard today, um, still um, hasn't um, repeated its peak purchasing power in 2003. Um, and uh, we have not come close to investing NIH um, with uh, sufficient funds to keep up with the pace of science. Today, um, someone getting their first what's called an R01 grant from NIH, which is the signal that you'll get promoted to professor someday in academia. Uh, the average uh, age at which one first gets such a grant, which were originally intended for young up-and-coming scientists, is now 41. Um, in addition, um, and this is particularly um, injurious and telling, um, the U.S. government um, funds very little mission-driven translational bioscience, um, which is in contrast to the way the government has supported the physical sciences since World War II. We do not have any DOE national labs for bio, although some of the labs do a little bit of bioscience. We do not have seven different budget categories for translational bioscience as DOD, for example, has for physical science. And we are definitely not investing in the kind of infrastructure uh, that we need to be competitive in the bioeconomy. And that's because basically biology has not been seen as a national priority, let alone a national security priority. It's been seen strictly as a biomed investment. China, on the other hand, has made very clear in policy documents, in speeches from leaders, 
uh, in every way that an authoritarian, authoritarian state can, uh, that it is going to dominate biotech. It's a top political, economic, and scientific priority. They have been saying so in the last two five-year plans, which govern their R&D spends. Uh, they have very specific goals. The government is investing large amounts of money in this. Um, and they have changed the rules of the Chinese FDA to more like ours, to be prepared to become innovators in the pharma market. Uh, they are building big infrastructure in bio. Um, and these, as is the case with most of what China does, are large public-private investments. They're building uh, incubators, they are building science parks, they are building gene banks and tissue banks, et cetera, et cetera. They also have a very detailed plan uh, to make sure their talent pipeline uh, is full. One interesting aspect of this is that China's uh, giant internet firms uh, like Baidu, Tencent, and so forth are becoming, in the last couple of years, actively engaged in biotech and in healthcare. They are doing this in precision medicine, but they are also doing it in um, digital health and in genomics. And these internet firms have particular expertise in um, artificial intelligence, and they are applying those in uh, the bio realm. Um, talent is critical in this competition. And as I said, China has a plan. We do not. Of all the foreign students in the United States, one third are Chinese, and about 40% of them are in the life sciences in biotech. Uh, they are developing their own innovative um, big pharma uh, capacities in China, and they are very successfully wooing uh, the top managers um, of uh, Merck, of AstraZeneca, of all of the big multinational global uh, bio firms to Chinese companies. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, now, China has very urgent and compelling reasons um, to invest in biomed and, and in biotech generally. Uh, it has an aging population. Um, the health of its people is very poor. They have the highest incidence of cancer in the world. They've got over 100 million diabetics. Um, and they have a um, growing middle class with great expectations of getting access to better health care. Meanwhile, they don't have enough doctors to service their population, and doctors take a long time to grow and train. Uh, they have a very limited healthcare infrastructure, not nearly enough hospitals, and most of their hospitals um, are quite primitive, which was part of the problem they experienced in Wuhan uh, during the COVID outbreak. Um, <clears throat> Only a small fraction of their hospitals in Wuhan um, were able to take care of COVID patients. And of course, they have a big challenge in feeding their population under conditions of changing climate. Um, <clears throat> the biomedical enterprise that we have built globally is very dependent on international collaboration. If you look at the top 10 science journals, 60% um, of the published article, bioscience journals, 60% of the top of the published articles are um, international, international collaborations. So we do not want to wreck that, as we seem to be intent on doing right now. We want to keep the basic science that underlies human disease and therapies for those disease uh, in the realm of openness and sharing. We want to cooperate on uh, finding new therapies and ways to prevent disease. Um, but China absolutely sees biotech um, as a means to acquire global economic and geopolitical power. It is very clear about this. Um, that's one of the reasons biotech is such a top priority across their many uh, strategic planning documents. Um, and they are uh, shifting their financial rules to favor Chinese firms. They are no longer just the manufacturer of drugs 
invented in the United States or Sweden and the UK. Uh, this year, they got their first innovative drug through FDA, and they are moving very fast in that direction. I already talked about their uh, use of AI skills. Next slide, please. So if we want to um, maintain our economic competitiveness, particularly um, in, um, in comparison with China, then we need to realize that this is a Sputnik moment. This really is a race, um, in part because um, amassing large genomic libraries, large collections of genomes that one has sequenced and also interpreted gives one a great advantage. And China has been doing that deliberately and aggressively for decades, and we have not. We have treated our gene bank as um, a little piece of the National Library of Medicine within NIH. It has not been well-funded, it has not been um, emphasized, and that alone, uh, the race to acquire large um, libraries of the planet's genomic heritage um, gives China an advantage starting out. Um, so we have to understand uh, that biotech uh, is now part of uh, not only our economic security, but also understand the national security implications of biotechnology, um, particularly in relation to China's challenge. We have to get much more strategic about integrating um, public health and epidemic preparedness into national security strategy, not just for civilian defense, but also for force protection. Because we are going, like I said, we're in an age of epidemics. We're going to see more natural outbreaks and um, uh, possibly uh, deliberate attacks. Um, so we ought to figure out how to measure and track these bioeconomies and uh, be able to make sense of them. We do not do that now. Um, different parts of biotech are counted differently, some not at all, synthetic biology not at all, for example. Um, and so we have a false picture of how important this is to our economy. We really have to get serious about a technical talent pipeline, uh, not just to feed the universities and make sure um, American kids are studying bio, um, but the public sector, the government, needs to know a lot more about biology and biotech and have a lot more ex uh, expertise uh, in order uh, to run the country, frankly. Um, and as I said, we need a plan for building a much more translational infrastructure, uh, a much more, a much stronger translational infrastructure for bioscience and biotech, possibly starting with some big projects. Um, you know, the physical sciences have large telescopes. We built the Large Hadron Collider. We built linear accelerators. The only big bio project the country has ever done has really been the Human Genome Project. Uh, which was at about, about a billion dollar buy, uh, and that was in 1993. Um, in the last couple of years, the Congress has strengthened um, reviews of Chinese investment in American biotech companies. I think this is a good thing, but we need to be um, aware that this is um, a very significant um, investment in uh, our translational capacity. And if we simply ban Chinese investment in uh, startup companies, we'll be very unhappy uh, with the outcome. Next slide. OK, COVID. Um, just a few remarks on this, uh, the topic I've been spending the last six months thinking and talking about. Next slide. <clears throat> um, as Duncan said, at IQT, we spent several years thinking about the biotechnologies that would be useful in identifying, um, managing, and quenching infectious disease epidemics. And we addressed this question because we needed some way to frame 
our investigation of everything that was going on in biotechnology, which is, you know, quite a uh, broad and complicated landscape. And basically, um, uh, you need uh, to address four big functional chunks to manage an epidemic. First of all, you have to be able to diagnose and characterize the pathogen. That's the first broad surveillance and detection block. If you cannot diagnose the pathogen, you cannot track the epidemic and you cannot stop it, as we are demonstrating today. The irony is that rapid, cheap, accurate diagnostics are eminently um, feasible techno technologically, um, but the absence of good diagnostics against infectious diseases is mostly a market failure. Um, the second functional um, issue that is essential is protecting the healthy. And uh, one could argue that this is even more important um, on a national security basis than treating the sick. The best way to protect the healthy is with vaccines. Vaccines are one of the most cost-effective uh, and amazing medical interventions humans have yet um, concocted. Um, but what we need is not the usual 10-year um, journey towards developing a vaccine. We need to be able to design, test, manufacture, and scale up vaccines on demand. Uh, we think that too is within reach. It's harder than the diagnostics, but it's not impossible. And when we're protecting the healthy, we have to prioritize healthcare workers as well as what we now are calling essential workers in order to keep the economy going and also in order to treat the sick. Um, treating the sick is very complicated. Therapeutics are actually harder to make usually than vaccines. Um, but um, one of the things that one needs to be able to accomplish in treating the sick is you have to keep hospitals functional. You can't stop treating heart attacks. You can't stop seeing people with strokes. You can't stop uh, delivering babies. And figuring out how to offload the pressure on the hospitals from the people suffering from the epidemic disease um, is a key part of epidemic response. And through all of this, you need to be able to collect, analyze, and disseminate uh, the information that you need to have situational awareness and make informed decisions. And as we are also seeing with COVID, our capacity to do this is very limited, uh, in part because of our very fragmented public health system. We have over 5,000 different state, local, city, uh, public health agencies in the United States, and they are not connected to each other, and they are not efficiently connected to CDC, nor does CDC have the analytical capacity to take in this data in near real time and make sense of it. And the public health system is uh, almost severed from the healthcare system. Very few governors, for example, even as of a month ago, had real-time data on how many ICU beds were filled or available in their states. So those are the four hunks uh, of functional capacities that you need. Some of these are not dependent on biotech, they're dependent upon other things like information processing, et cetera, et cetera. But without these uh, four uh, functional capacities, you can't handle an epidemic. Next slide. <clears throat> and um, here's how the biorevolution in particular um, has and might have, um, to an even greater degree, helped us manage COVID. And it's not over yet, needless to say. Um, the SARS-CoV vi uh, virus was um, isolated and sequenced, and that sequence was shared globally in record time. China did it first. It's now been done many dozens of times by many uh, organizations and many countries. That is essential. It took us three months to do that in SARS in 2003. We did this in about 12 days. 
Phylogenetics, which is uh, the process of following the mutation and the evolution of the virus over time as it goes to place to place, <clears throat> has been recognized since the West African Ebola outbreaks as being a very useful tool. And it has been uh, critical in helping us understanding how the virus spread globally. So we now know as a consequence of phylogenetics that New York City uh, was infected not by China, not by people coming from China, but by people coming from Europe, as they you know, habitually do into New York. Um, the diagnostic story has been a very sad one of lost chances. You all know about um, the failure of CDC to rapidly uh, create a um, PCR test that worked. Um, even more important, I think history will show, was the failure of the government to engage the private sector's cooperation fully in flooding um, the market with various kinds of diagnostic tests that were then available, and also failure to, even today, develop a strategic roadmap to get the kind of diagnostics we really want. What we want is diagnostics that are accurate and work like pregnancy tests that you can use in your home or as you go into the office uh, that are very easy to interpret and that say you are or you are not infected with COVID. These are coming. Uh, two of these, both based upon CRISPR technology, have already passed emergency youth authorization by FDA. And as I said, more will coming. We should have made a drive for them starting about six months ago. It, would be, it will be a different world when these arrive and are very widely available, which will be the next hurdle. Can we upscale manufacturing? Um, people working on new therapeutics um, are uh, using synthetic biology very heavily. They are uh, practicing on synthetic viruses to see uh, what will clamp on and stop the virus. Monoclonal antibodies may be uh, the first big hope of something that will really treat um, people who are really sick with COVID. Uh, these are in clinical trials already, and they act as kind of short-lived vaccines. So we may be able to use them um, to protect healthcare workers and essential workers or to treat the very sick. Um, and we're trying to use AI to find drugs that are already out there and marketed that might be used against COVID, but there's very little coordination of this and it's uh, hit and mix. Um, vaccines um, are the most um, intensely targeted um, areas for synthetic bio in particular. Next slide. Depending on who you believe, uh, there's somewhere between 170 and 190 um, attempts in making a COVID-19 vaccine underway. <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, the five different categories of vaccines that are most advanced. Um, the first two columns uh, depict um, very innovative vaccines dependent on, in the first place, uh, these are gene-based vaccines, <clears throat> the column that says DNA and RNA vaccine. Um, and what they're trying to do is reprogram um, the immune system to go after the viral proteins and kill the virus. Um, <clears throat> Moderna is the poster child for this type of vaccine. The government has put a lot of money into Moderna. The downside is we have never actually licensed such a vaccine. And so there will be a lot of questions about safety, <clears throat> even if they're proven efficacious. And there's also a real question as whether or not we can scale up DNA or RNA synthesis to the degree needed. Um, <clears throat> there are also a couple of companies, one in particular that IQT invested in some time ago, that basically reprogram the virus, reprogram COVID, so that it cannot replicate quickly enough to cause disease, but it acts as a perfect antigen. It tricks the immune system into thinking it's the real virus. Um, that will be very interesting. Inactivated viruses are the type that the Chinese are going after. These are old technologies for making vaccines. 
Um, the worry is that with COVID, they may cause um, people who then get infected after being vaccinated to get even sicker. Um, but China is uh, already um, getting ready to use one of these inactivated vaccines um, for their military. And the other two uh, approaches are also being pursued. The companies listed on the bottom are the ones at the beginning uh, that, that are moving fastest and for whom we have the most hope. Uh, but as I said, there's over 100 companies in the race. Unfortunately, it's not well coordinated. Uh, that coordination was not helped by uh, the US dropping out of WHO, which is acting as the de facto um, head. Um, of this effort, uh, but there's a lot of science being done, really unprecedented effort across the world. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so um, I hope that made you as optimistic. Um, this should temper your enthusiasm a little bit. Of When we made the slide, there were 125 vaccines that still hadn't made it into any kind of human trial. They were still being worked at on the bench or with animals. Uh, seven vaccines are in uh, phase one trials. That is, does this vaccine uh, cause any harm to people when we give it to healthy volunteers? Seven are in uh, later stage safety trials. Uh, one, only one, is in a phase three trial, which is uh, expensive and uh, takes several months uh, to complete. So we are at the beginning of this um, uh, quest, um, and it's complex science, complex manufacturing, um, and as I say, it's mostly uncoordinated. Next slide. But this is, I mean, COVID is a classic story of epidemics. Um, epidemics are very different from other kinds of catastrophes and from natural disasters. Um, and this is true throughout history. Um, they unfold slowly. You know, they always catch you unawares. It's, it's a long leap from thinking something weird is happening to throwing everything you've got against it. Um, and that's where uh, responders, governments throughout history, even when they had the capacity to respond, um, have fallen down. They usually go on for years, and it looks like this one will too. It looks like we're going to be in this for about two years at least, would be my guess. They're always confusing. Um, especially at the beginning, uh, when they are happening in different places, reported differently, um, expanding at different paces, et cetera, et cetera. This is particularly true when it's a new pathogen we haven't seen before. West Nile was very puzzling. SARS was very puzzling. MERS was a little bit easier to understand because we'd just gone through SARS. And it is not coincidental that South Korea has done such a good job, relatively speaking, responding to COVID. They had a very recent near-death experience with MERS when a couple of imported cases of that disease and of the coronavirus um, uh, infecting people coming in from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia almost toppled their healthcare system. Um, so they built infrastructure, they got ready, and they used that response capacity in COVID. Um, situational awareness is always challenging. You never know what's going on. Uh, data always lags events, and it's very hard to get good data to inform decisions. Everybody is in denial for a long time. Um, and epidemics always accentuate existing uh, social frictions, uh, which is one of the reasons so many novels are written about epidemics. It's a perfect landscape or, or canvas on which to uh, examine a society. Scapegoating is ubiquitous. It always occurs um, and is usually very hurtful and lasts a long time. People and Africa are still being denied housing if they had Ebola, even if they've recovered. Um, and the response burden falls on social systems that are chronically 
uh, underfunded and overburdened to begin with, as we're seeing. And the consequences of big epidemics um, are often quite severe, uh, though they fall on equally on society and long lived. That said, um, we could do much better now, given the technologies we've had, if we had uh, the will uh, and the organization needed to employ them. And I'll stop there. Um, sorry to go on so long. Thank you very much. Happy to answer some questions, Duncan. Okay, um, we have a few questions. Uh, the first one is, is where does India, now a major defense partner, sit in the biotech sphere? That's a great question. India is complicated. It has a lot of science talent. It is a um, <clears throat> very active manufacturer, particularly of generic drugs, drugs others have invented that have come off patent. Um, they are pretty self-sufficient when it comes to vaccines. Um, several um, American companies that are trying to create an innovative COVID vaccine have partnered with Indian manufacturers um, who have promised to make the vaccine uh, should it prove useful. Um, that said, um, hopes for them becoming um, sources of innovation in biomed have not proved out so far. Um, they have uh, tried but not completely succeeded in establishing um, standards that uh, would be globally recognized as adequate uh, for manufacturing uh, many vaccines. And that basically is, I think, their next big hurdle. But they have a lot of good science, a lot of manufacturing capa capacity. They need to improve their own indigenous FDA and um, ability to meet global standards for safety and reproducibility and so forth. Okay. The, um, the next question is, is how do we cooperate with other nations in the biotech area and yet, yet not create a potent adversary? And kind of the follow on to that is, uh, involves U.S. intellectual property and how do we stop the stealing of that in this particular area if we are sharing? Yeah. Well, I think we need to make a distinction between basic science and biotechnology. Basic science, you know, how the living world works should be uh, openly, public, openly published, peer reviewed and available to all. How you translate that science into a product, into a gene engineered plant genome or into um, a, um, <clears throat> a new therapy um, should be subject to intellectual property laws and not shared. That's part that's part of, uh, that should be part of a country's, excuse me, economy and, and uh, economic property. But particularly when it comes to managing human disease and problems like how are we going to feed the planet during climate change, we need to create arenas for collaboration and cooperation. Um, and that requires um, getting state departments involved in formulating um, uh, new ways of thinking about what's shared and what isn't and how we apply patents and how we think through uh, um, uh, who pays for what. Um, this is going to be a whole new world um, and we need to get busy uh, making it. Um, it would be very useful to the United States if we were the ones setting the standards. And we certainly have the scientific uh, capacity and prominence to do that. Um, but we need the State Department to call the meeting. And we need to get others, starting with our friends, uh, to uh, start establishing the guidelines and the practice standards, uh, just as we have done with a lot of other engineered um, uh, products. And we, what we want to do is we want to create a level playing field that's very transparent, such that if you're not in the agreement, if you're not adhering to these standards, you are disadvantaged. So that's what we need to do. It will be, you know, the work of a generation, but we need to get started. 
The next question is, is what type of research in this area is being done in Europe or in other nations? And an example that was given is like Israel. Mm -hmm. um, Europe is very active. Um, Israel is also active. It's smaller, of course, so it's, its volume of bioresearch is uh, less than that of Europe. I would say in synthetic biology, the UK uh, is second to the United States and is actually, when last we looked, which was about two and a half years ago, doing half of the synthetic biology in Europe. The UK uh, is the source of all of the major DNA sequencing technology that we have. They have a very rich um, intellectual foundation in bioscience. Um, and they, along with 20 other countries, have a strategy for how they are going to invest in synthetic biology. Asia is also in the game, particularly Singapore, and of course, as I said, China. So I'm going to combine two questions on the next one, and that is, um, what is the scope and scale of additional research or investment that's needed by NIH to set the U.S. on a viable path going forward? Um, so that's that's part one. And are there other strategic things besides major investments by NIH that are required going forward? Yeah, that, okay, that's a great um, that's a great start. NIH does basic research. Um, they should continue to do basic research. They should not become the translational arm of um, the life sciences. That I think should be a new institution. Uh, and there's many different ways of setting that up. There's a bill uh, in Congress now called the Endless Frontier Bill that would establish the Ni National Science Foundation um, as not only the, the um, basic science research entity that it is, but would also build in a new technology development arm. Uh, this is not, this is science overall, not just biology. Um, that's an interesting idea. I think it would be complicated to enact. Um, I would like to see one of the DOE national labs be partly or wholly dedicated to translating bio, particularly for national security purposes, not weapons, but defense, um, and help us um, uh, establish operational standards um, and uh, further refine key technologies. Uh, the DOE labs were very important in uh, operationalizing uh, the Human Genome Project and making it scalable. I think they could do the same thing again for bio. Um, we need to build new infrastructure. We should take a much more serious interest in the U.S. gene bank called GenBank. Um, I think we should unearth it from its current uh, status buried in the National Library of Medicine. Um, and uh, there are other things that we could do. Tissue banks, for example, would have been very useful in COVID. Everybody was running around trying to scrape up a copy of the virus. That ought not to be the case. Should we have an InQtel type organization for biodefense? Should we? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. The next one is, is um, What's your best estimate of how many deaths might finally occur due to COVID-19 in the United States? Well, um, <clears throat> that is really hard to say. <clears throat> um, a, a lot depends on us and um, what we do and how we manage things going forward and over what period of time um, you're counting deaths. I mean, we're now, the U.S. is 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's COVID cases and deaths. Um, we're at uh, 3.5 million uh, infections, I think, in the United States. And I think today we hit 133,000 deaths and it's going up quite steeply. Um, and it's going up in 43 states um, in July. Um, so uh, that trajectory uh, could be very bad. You know, we're six months in with 133,000 cases. Um, and we seem to be accelerating um, the, um, 
the curve <clears throat> over the last six weeks or so. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it's going to be difficult getting out of this. Um, masks would be my first wish, a universal um, rule that everybody in public must wear a mask. Um, even if the mask is a crummy mask, uh, modeling has shown it makes a big difference in cutting down transmission. And the more people that wear them, the bigger that difference. Um, I think that um, large gatherings are a particularly bad idea. Uh, whether schools should open and how, I think needs to be, you know, reasonably debated and carefully followed so that we acquire data. We're going to get a vaccine, um, but it could be a long time before one is available in general. And it's going to be a long time. It's going to be years before it's available to the world. And as long as there's hotspots in other parts of the world, we are at risk. We, we truly are all in this together. So the next one is, is given that a vaccine um, could likely take a long time to develop and then also get it out to the rest of the world, leaving hotspots, um, would we be better off focusing on creating treatments or therapeutics uh, such as antivirals for those who either contract COVID or some other pathogen and get sick? It's not an either or. We have to do both. Um, as I said, therapeutics are very difficult to develop because you get into issues of dose, absorption, uh, a lot of medicines look good in the lab, but then when you eat them, your liver chews them up, or they poison your kidneys, they have toxic side effects. Um, <clears throat> we are, uh, there's a lot of companies working on therapeutics uh, so far. Um, the world does not have any good antiviral medicines um, for COVID. Uh, remdesivir um, looks like it decreased the hospital stays for the sickest patients, but it's no panacea. It took us a long time with a um, huge effort to come up with the cocktail of medicines that ultimately held the HIV virus at bay. These viruses are very tricky to deal with. There's not going to be any simple antiviral um, available anytime soon. My guess is what we will use on patients I'm fortunate enough to get sick is a combination of therapies. So going back to the IQT question for biodefense and kind of piling onto that one, is IQT currently enjoying success in finding IC other organizations to fund a sufficient amount of biodefense projects or companies to at least move us forward in the short term? Well, our customers um, traditionally are mostly the intelligence community and uh, they have not seen advancing biotech as uh, their main mission. So the short answer is no. Um, IQT has spent um, its own money on the effort that we ran as, and it's part of something that we do regularly um, to look into emerging technologies that we think will eventually be useful and or disruptive uh, to the national security community. Um, so uh, I think, just to back up a little bit, I think the secret sauce of IQT is that uh, we can speak the language, not just of the government, but also of the startups, the small innovative companies from which innovative technology is coming generally, not just in bio, and also uh, to the investors, to the venture capital community that basically keep these small startups afloat. Um, so I think the model is a very unique one. Uh, given my experience in government, I found IQT to be extremely useful. Um, and I think the key to success going forward is, if not reproducing IQT, um, then uh, forging new vibrant living links between the private sector in the United States particularly in biotech and the public sector. We need to get those two uh, communities together, talking and collaborating more effectively on behalf of national security. Okay, thank you. Um, 
we're out of questions and we're going to call it a night. And first, thank you to Dr. O'Toole for, for being with us tonight and spending her time with us and speaking to us. Thank you to all the members for, for joining us. Um, hopefully folks can join us on September 24th. And uh, to everyone, take care, be safe, be healthy, and we'll see you in mid-September. And have thank a good night. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. you too. Bye-bye.